Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Korea Foundation Virtual Dialogue, Green Technologies to Enhance Korea-Australia Regional Collaboration. I'm Jason Lee, Dean of Grad School of International Studies at Korea University, and I'm privileged to be the moderator of Virtual Dialogue. Today's event is the fifth and the last session of the Green Recovery Series. This series discusses the ways to reboot our future in greener and smarter way from the current challenges of pandemic and global warming. Especially, it highlighted international collaboration for sustainable recovery and low carbon transition. The finale of this special series is Korea-Australian Green Technology Cooperation. And this is a very timely and crucial topic for both countries. Nowadays, carbon neutrality is rapidly becoming a global norm and a big race for decarbonization has just started. Both Korea and Australia as major economies and smart powers in international relations try to run ahead in this critical transition. I'm thankful for the Korea Foundation to have organized the dialogue on this important agenda. Today, we have prominent panelists for presentation and discussion. First of all, I'm pleased to invite Professor Gordon Flake, CEO of Perth US Asia Center at the University of Western Australia for opening remark. Professor Flake is one of the world's leading authorities in the, in the Indo-Pacific affairs and Korean affairs too. He kindly joined in this event, and we will now have Professor Flake on the virtual podium. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Flake. Well, thank you, Jason. Uh, it is a great honor for the Perth US Asia Center to collaborate together with the Korea Foundation on this important series. Uh, and we're also honored to represent Australia in this endeavor. Uh, we have long believed that Korea and Australia are important partners in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and when we are talking about recovering from the pandemic, when we're talking about resources, when we're talking about energy and innovation, uh, there are two countries that have a lot in common uh, and a real mandate for cooperation. Uh, just last December, uh, the Perth US Asia Center released the fifth in a series of edited volumes on the Indo-Pacific focusing very specifically on Korea's uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. I was honored to write a chapter on the bilateral Korea-Australia relationship uh, and to see a, a seminar like this, a virtual seminar like this uh, co-organized, I think really gives evidence uh, for how much potential there is in the relationship. As it happens, just yesterday, uh, the center released a report uh, in a public event based on a, a longstanding project we have done funded by the Australia Korea Foundation uh, from our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, that looked at the potential uh, for Australia Korea relations in a broad range of issues in security and in, 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 in energy as we'll be discussing today in innovation and critical materials uh, in broader diplomacy, supply chains, et cetera. Um, but there's probably no area where the relationship is more well-grounded and well-established than in resources. Uh, Australia has been a very important exporter to Korea of coal in the early stages uh, for the last several decades in iron ore, uh, and, and in recently uh, in, in LNG, in liquefied natural gas. But having said that, I think the thing that makes us most excited isn't what we've done in the past, but what the potential there is for Australia-Korea cooperation in the future. Uh, and so I, I want to applaud the Korea Foundation for this series uh, and for recognizing that when it comes to hydrogen, when it comes to next generation technologies, uh, not only does Australia have uh, the, the resources, but it also has the, the, the corporations, the, the, the know-how and the technology that can be well paired with Korea. Let me end with kind of an observation that both Korea and Australia as countries have done a very good job of managing up and managing down. In other words, we, we put a lot of effort and time into maintaining our relationship with our shared alliance partner, the United States, 
but also with Europe, with China, with Japan, et cetera. And both Australia and Korea do a really good job of engaging other countries around the world that benefit from our strengths in our economic resources and our expertise. Uh, so we manage down very well. But the one thing that we have not done nearly well enough is to work together, uh, to work across as peers. Uh, because both Korea and Australia have very similar sized GDPs. We're both members of, of, the, of the G20. Uh, we're very proactive in that environment. And I think the focus of this seminar and the focus of this series of seminars by the Korea Foundation really highlights the tremendous potential there is for Australia-Korea relations, for us to work together to overcome the pandemic, to build on the resources and technologies that we both share uh, and to find synergistic ways for us to, to, to jointly uh, move into a new future. So I'm delighted that the, the Perth US Asia Center could again, co-sponsor this. It's great to see on the screen, my, my good friend Lee Gun, the president of the Korea Foundation. It's a great honor to, to collaborate with him. And I appreciate uh, Professor E.J. Sung's moderation of this. Uh, and I look forward to the, the presentations and to engaging in the conversation as we go forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Blake. Uh, now, uh, let me have an honor to invite President Kun Lee of the Korea Foundation who hosted, who hosted this event for opening remark. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President Kun Lee. Seems like we have some, uh, some minor issues uh, in, in audio system. So uh, let me excuse for a few seconds uh, to set up the technical the issues. So uh, without further ado, uh, I will move to the presentation session. I'm pleased have to have four prominent experts on the issues of green technologies. Let me briefly introduce the panel. Mr. Songbo Kim uh, is the chief executive officer of H2 Korea and he has a long career at the Korea Agency for Technology and Standard CATS, as well as many Korean ministries and currently leading the hydrogen project group. Uh, Mr. James Brown is a policy fellow at the, the Perth US Asia Center and actively addresses the issues of green technology as a researcher, writer, journalist, and consultant. Ms. Miranda Taylor is the Chief Executive Officer at NERA, a Na National Energy Resources Australia, uh, which works on the project to make Australia a global energy powerhouse. And finally, uh, Professor Jun Xin Li uh, is a renowned fellow professor at Song Kyung Kwan University and currently uh, serving as the president of Korean Society for New and Renewable energy. He has directed many national, academic, and private, private projects in green technologies. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'm uh, really thrilled to listen to the insight of the panelists. The only thing I concern today is that we have a very limited time for the session. So I kindly suggest each presenter deliver the essence of the presentation in 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, I will first invite the CEO Sungbo Kim for a presentation. So shall we get started, Mr. Kim? Okay, thank you, Mr. Jason Lee. And I, I share my uh, presentation for all. Can you see? Okay. Looks fine. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name is Sungbok Kim, CEO of Est Korea. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to all distinguished guests for your active interest in the hydrogen economy and participation today. I'm very pleased to introduce the current status of Korean hydrogen economy and industry. For those who, of you who are not familiar with uh, East Korea yet, I would like to introduce our organization first. Uh, East Korea is a public-private consultative body 
established to support early transition to a hydrogen economy. And we were designated as a promotion dedicated organization June last year by government. We are carrying out various tasks that read the Korean hydrogen economy. Firstly, I would like to start my presentation with introducing why transition to a hydrogen economy in, is important. Fossil fuels are the main driver of climate changes and has brought serious environmental issues and resulted in resource depletion of the earth. To tackle these issues, the global society is pursuing effort to avoid dangerous climate change. As a part of this, a clean energy, hydrogen, has emerged. And the world has now recognized hydrogen as alternative for fossil fuels. In January 2019, the Korean government announced the hydrogen economy roadmap and the world's first hydrogen rule was enacted in February last year to realize hydrogen economy in Korea. In July, the hydrogen economy committee was launched to discuss and establish the hydrogen policies. Following December, President Moon Jae-in declared carbon neutrality by 2050 and announced the implementation plan for net zero society. Recently, the third economic committee was held to discuss way of expanding hydrogen economy infrastructure and boosting private investment. From now on, I will tell you more details of the hydrogen roadmap. Under the vision of becoming a world leader of the hydrogen economy, the government presented its development strategies and targets across the entire hydrogen value chain. Korea also established a long-term and specific plan and presented a clear direction for the implementation of the hydrogen economy. In 2018, there were 14 units of HRS and 1,800 units of FCVs supplied. These figures are expected to expand to 1,200 HRS and 6.2 million units in 24, respectively. Indeed, we are already seeing tangible outcomes thanks to the joint effort of the public and private sectors. There were significant achievements mainly in the field of utilization. For instance, 14,426 units of FCVs have been supplied. And 88 hydrogen refueling stations have been deployed. Furthermore, the capacity of the fuel cell power generation exceeded 650 megawatt as of this year, May. For furthermore expansion of the hydrogen economy, Korean government is allocating more budgets on this area. The total amount is about 754 billion won, which has been increased four times compared to that of 2019. Also, ministries are actively expanding their budget of R&D and demonstration project accordingly. Local government are also putting their efforts on promoting specialized projects such as hydrogen bio city production cluster, R&D specialized city, FCV cluster. We are sure that everyone can experience this the hydrogen economy in real life by 2030. Under the clear and long-term signals by government on hydrogen economy, private sector also actively jump 
into it. In the third meeting of Hydrogen Economy Committee, five groups, including SK, Hyundai, Costco, Hanwha, Hyosung, and numerous small and medium-sized companies announced 43 trillion won scale investment plans to build a full cycle hydrogen ecosystem. Throughout the whole value chain of the hydrogen market, many companies are trying hard to have their portions. Still, the utilization field seems dominant. However, there are numerous R&D as well as demonstrated projects ongoing, which will contribute to expand and innovate the hydrogen market. Also, most of these companies currently has been forming close relations with other global companies from abroad. The transition to a hydrogen economy cannot be achieved with only one country's effort. And international cooperation is most essential to realize global hydrogen economy. So Korea is actively establishing a global supply chain to import clean hydrogen from overseas to achieve net zero. To this end, the clean hydrogen overseas business group was launched last June, June last year, with the participation of more than 30 companies and in institutions. This project initiated with a basic feasibility study, which scheduled be completed this year. As a second step, we are planning to carry out demonstration project over the next four to five years. In the final commercialization stage, we will realize the supply chain once the long, large scale and private red demonstration projects are completed. We expect that 15 stable overseas clean hydrogen supply chains will be established by 2040 and 50 by 2050. As you can realize in the previous slide, Australia, of course, could be one of the potential partners that we consider to import hydrogen from. For this, there must be long-term strategies and organizational structures between two countries. East Korea will be always at the front line of all the effort to realize the firm connection between two countries. That was all I want to share with you today. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim. Uh, well, we will, well, Certainly, you have have a lot more to to say, but uh, we will we will continue with, with the the more of the, of the Korean hydrogen stories in the discussion session. Okay, uh, so uh, let me uh, move to our second presentation, and now I will invite James Bowen uh, for the second presentation. So, Mr. Bowen, please. Thank you, and. Uh... Thank you to the Career Foundation for the opportunity to speak. And um, thanks to Mr. Kim for those opening words. They really set the scene for my own presentation because there's no, there's no Australian hydrogen superpower opportunity without Korea and other countries creating the demand. And I also want to acknowledge the role that Ms. Kim's organization, H2 Korea, plays in, in fostering international cooperation on hydrogen, including with Australia, because that's critical to, to realizing hydrogen's potential as the Indo-Pacific and, and the global energy of the future. Now, before I look at the, uh, the Australian hydrogen superpower opportunity, I want to briefly explain what that term superpower means in an energy context or how we interpret it, I think, at the Perth US Asia Centre. So obviously, Australia is not a superpower in the broadest geopolitical sense, but we have frequently been counted among the world's energy superpowers. This is mainly uh, a result of our regional and our global export leadership in LNG and coal, as Gordon mentioned. And so those have provided huge gains in commercial terms, but, uh, but many of the, the spoils of those industries have been in a strategic nature, a more strategic nature. The meeting the energy and, and, and economic security needs of our trading partners has provided an opportunity and an imperative to uh, improve our international relationships. 
it's helped underpin a, a relatively strong Australian role in determining broader Indo-Pacific affairs. So as an energy superpower, we've gained diplomatic access that, uh, that often approaches that level that other genuine geopolitical superpowers enjoy by virtue of their size alone. So in this context, uh, what I think the emerging hydrogen economy most provides Australia is an opportunity to replicate some of our past energy link successes in a low carbon world, as well as the requisite demand that's coming out of Korea, Japan and other markets. Australia has all the necessary attributes to become a regional export powerhouse on hydrogen. And I don't want to step on uh, Ms. Ta Ms. Taylor's presentation a little bit, but I'll go into a few of those. Um, so first we concentrate on the green hydrogen space. Um, Australia has some of the world's most abundant and affordably produced renewable energy resources. Now, I just want to share one slide at the moment. Just one second. So this is uh, a a uh, slide that was an image that was provided by the Belfer Centre at Harvard University and it's an indication of the annual renewable generation potential from solar and wind power around the world and what I love most about this is that Australia is a, a rich shade of burgundy on that map and it's not even on the scale if you look down the bottom uh, such as our comparative advantage on that and that's a function also of um, export potential and how much actually of that we use uh, for domestic for domestic means. So second uh, in our list of key attributes that Australia can uh, can call on is our sufficient fresh water to satisfy the anticipated short term growth in hydrogen production, green hydrogen production, and also some options that will sustain longer term expansion on that front. Now this might seem a bit surprising in for such a dry continent, yet servicing uh, the hydrogen importing needs of Japan which is expected to be the global leader on imports for a while out to 2030 is estimated to require just one percent of our current mining industry needs uh, so strong growth across across numerous import markets could see that rise to as much as a third of mining industry needs um, water needs in the future but uh, this too could be serviced if we have options such as diverting water from those competing sectors and we we look at desalination and water recycling and other other areas so I, thought, I think we accept that there will be a sizable role for fossil fuels for some time with emissions abatement. So in the transition to green economy, Australia is also well positioned on that front. That's a result of our considerable natural gas and coal operations and their associated potential to employ technologies such as carbon capture and storage. Now it's admittedly somewhat, a somewhat controversial pathway to get to green, but I, I do know that the Korean hydrogen economy roadmap foresees the role for importing quote brown coal in an eco-friendly way in the short term. And it's a similar story in Japan, which is currently pursuing a hydrogen supply chain test project with Australia based on brown coal and potential CCS in the state of Victoria. Now, so finally, Australia has a head start on many of the countries in our region in developing the policy settings, the trade and investment relationships, and even some of the physical infrastructure that's necessary to facilitate expanding trade in hydrogen. This is again a result of our, of our past successes in exporting commodities such as gas and coal as well as non-energy resources such as iron ore to countries such as Korea over several decades. Now we've earned an invaluable reputation as a reliable trading partner in the Indo-Pacific, as possessing an open investment climate and as being a willing partner on mutual market development and hydrogen will be the next step in that chain. So the Australian government set three main goals to achieve by 2030 in its national hydrogen strategy, which was released in 2019. Number one, we wanna be a top three exporter to Asia. Number two, we want to be a destination of choice for international investors. And number three, we want to have major offtake or supply chain agreements in place with importing countries by that date of 2030. So the goal is to largely replicate what we've achieved elsewhere once again and, and allow Australia to continue serving as an energy superpower, even in an increasingly low carbon world, as I said. So just a second slide, I'm uh, just going to share. which is global hydrogen projects across the value chain around the world. That's from the Hydrogen Council. You can see some really big uh, dots there in the, on the Australian um, landmass. Um, Europe is obviously a big centre of activity, but you can see that the, the, the projects that are emerging in Australia are comparably larger than a lot of the places that will be production and export focused. And a lot of these bigger uh, sort of smaller ones are, and uh, clusters around the world are more 
demand focused and, and production focused. So most of those most of those Australian projects have an export focus and a logical orientation towards the towards the Indo-Pacific, which is which is developing into a major centre of, of global hydrogen activity, as I said. Now I said earlier that Australia has both an opportunity and an imperative to work with other countries to help realise our hydrogen superpower ambitions. Now that's because a range of very considerable obstacles must be overcome if Indo-Pacific economies are to achieve our mutual expectations in this sector. I think uh, most people will be aware of them. Foremost among the obstacles are the need to rapidly bring down the cost of green hydrogen and also low carbon uh, hydrogen pathways other than green. Um, and we need to facilitate potentially trillions of dollars worth of infrastructure spending across the value chain over a, a long period of time. And I, th I think the, su the success of the Espraya Korea partnership will be among the most important in responding to these challenges. And thankfully, we've made a bit of a head start on that. Our two countries signed a letter of intent on hydrogen cooperation in September 2019, and we began working on a bilateral hydrogen action plan in 2020. And, uh, and returning to Mr Kim's work again, I believe H2 Korea and the Australian Hydrogen Council are working to foster some of the business to business linkages that will be absolutely vital to future success. So those are critical channels for bilateral cooperation, though much more will inevitably be needed. Now, speaking from the Australian perspective, there's certainly an ongoing need for well resourced, continuous, and clearly defined engagement with Korea as well as other countries. But it's a positive sign as well, though, that most Australian states and territories also have developed their own strategies for hydrogen, including around export facilitation and, and some elements of international cooperation. And some states, such as uh, my own home state, Western Australia, they have dedicated hydrogen ministers to uh, that are tasked with that. So commitments from the, these different jurisdictions will help maintain international progress in tandem with those coming from the Commonwealth and the private sector. Now, I believe, that, I believe the Korean Ministry for Trade, Industry and Energy is studying a number of prospective production partners to help achieve its goals. And it's clear to me that Australia is better placed than potential competitors such as the US and Saudi Arabia to fill this role for the reasons I've outlined above, around resource endowment, around economic capacity and our past experience. But it's gonna be critical for public and private interests in this country to ensure that this remains the fact. And uh, we must also ensure that Korean interests remain fully aware of that. So I mentioned that uh, becoming a hydrogen superpower would be not only an, an economic, but a strategic opportunity for Australia. And I think that an ability to add another string to the bow of the relationship with Korea is one of the most valuable of these opportunities. And our, our two countries have proven that some of the ties that you can derive from commodity-based trade and investment can help to foster more expansive interactions, more diplomatic interactions, and an emerging hydrogen inter interdependency would help to consolidate that relationship. It would be particularly valuable at a time when our region, the Indo-Pacific, is becoming increasingly complex and even conflict-prone in some areas. So we need that level of cooperation to continue. And so as, in, as well as increased engagement in a wide range of areas, Australia and Korea's hydrogen partnership could extend our leadership in, in multilateral fora and also engagement with key blocks such as the Association for Southeast Asian Nations of Southeast Asian Nations, which is only now starting to look at hydrogen as a major energy future option. So diplomatically leveraging hydrogen growth I think uh, in closing could make a vital contribution to realizing Australia and Korea's vast array of shared interests. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bowen. Oh, you, you have, have uh, covered the, the broad range of, of issues ranging from Australia's the, the export uh, issues to the multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific. Okay. Uh, our third presenter is Miranda Taylor, and now the floor is yours, Ms. Taylor. Thank you very, thank you very much, um, and a fantastic scene setting by Mr. Kim and, and Mr. Bowen. So I'm delighted to participate in this Korean Foundation um, dialogue, and, and I, I concur with all the previous speakers on the absolute vital importance of the relationship the strategic partnerships between key trading partners such as Australia and Korea um, and that um, Australia as it as it moves to uh, along with the rest of the world regenerate uh, as we come out of COVID-19 is looking to partner with countries where we can um, benefit from the enormous technology know-how that countries like Korea have, the manufacturing, um, and, and enable Australia not just to partner with uh, the development of hydrogen production projects, 
but also the manufacturing of all the technologies and all the smarts that are going to be needed to enable that industry. I think that's a vital part of the future that we're all trying to move down is to get, uh, we want to be exporting energy, but we also want to be a more complex economy in Australia and, and partner with countries like Korea to do that. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so just bear with me while I put my PowerPoint up. Um, I will try and do a fairly fast romp through the slides because um, I'm very mindful of the time. Um, it hasn't come up. I'm going to try again. Sorry that the, 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 it didn't work. Um, so I'll keep talking while I'm... Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is um, uh, the, the technology clusters that NIR has been supporting. For some reason, when I put it onto the main, the full screen, it's not, not working. So I might have to just do it like this as a non full screen. Um, so my apologies for that. It's not working. So I just a little very quick introduction to near us that I'm the CEO of an organization that is um, working on the energy transition. So we have worked very extensively with the LNG and gas industry in the past. And we're now working very much in that energy transition um, space. And we're really focused on trying to scale and commercialize the technologies for the energy transition. Clearly, Hydrogen is a key future fuel, but also a, a technology and a storage uh, enabler for the energy transition. Um, and um, yeah, we've already touched upon the fact that Australia is well positioned to play a leading role, but so is Korea. And so our partnership with countries like Korea is really vital to us. Um, we do have the resources in Australia. We have, you know, vast uh, renewable and there's no doubt that the cost of those renewables has significantly dropped in recent years, which is meaning that it's it's the time frame for getting hydrogen to be competitive is, is, is tighter. I do think that probably in the very short run, we're still looking at um, uh, gas to hydrogen and, 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 uh, and other options, but very quickly with, with green hydrogen coming in behind. Um, we're targeting in Australia uh, hydrogen under $2 and scale is clearly the way that we're going to be able to achieve that. 90% of the cost reduction come from, for non-transport applications come from scaling the supply chains, which is really where NERA has focused our, our efforts. So as, as has been um, described, Australia, like every other country, has, has announced a series of national and state-based hydrogen roadmaps or strategies. And one of the uh, actions in the national hydrogen roadmap or, or, or strategy was that NERA would coordinate um, some work around the small businesses and technology companies. Now, it's a, challenging, it's a challenging landscape in the sense that at the moment, we don't have the scale of either the, the supply chain or the demand, the end users. So we're working in a market that we're still activating, notwithstanding that there is already demand for hydrogen as industrial feedstock um, and in ammonia for agriculture. But we really are having to work on the marketplace, you know, invest in the infrastructure, find the, uh, make the production projects, find the customers and the end uses of hydrogen and what are, what are they going to be? And, and then making sure that we've got the capabilities to, to supply all of that. So it, it's, a, it's a really challenging ask and we all, we absolutely need to collaborate together um, to get there because it's going to take everybody. And the, I would actually add in that in terms of thinking about the energy transition salute future and getting to the, the, the net zero by 2050, we have to have very open minds and we have to work collectively across the world to find whatever solutions we can that are going to work. And it isn't really going to be cherry picking one or two solutions. We're going to have to find lots of solutions to decarbonize. And we're going to have to look at our whole economy, not just the energy sector, but all the energy users um, are going to have to work, work through the decarbonization story. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a big challenge, but a really exciting one. And obviously the industries that are hard to abate like steel and aluminium uh, you know, are big opportunities for us to, to, to work on the end users of hydrogen. Um, 
Now, Mira has been focused on clusters, and I, I want to just unpick this language a little bit because the word cluster is you and hubs and precincts are used a lot around the world, um, and they're used interchangeably in some cases. So when Nira is talking about clusters, we're very much talking about technology clusters based on an economic model that Michael Porter announced um, uh, oh, a good over 20, 20 40 years ago. Um, it, it's a well-known um, concept of small businesses or a geographic group of interconnected companies and, and sometimes universities in a particular field that can come together and they can force multiply or or expand their offerings by working together. Um, it's proved that cluster technology clusters uh, get more patents. Uh, they grow. They grow small businesses faster. They grow technologies, um, and they can provide visibility to the marketplace as to where the technology capabilities are in the economy. And they can also do things like develop skills and do joint research projects together. So they're really powerful. Um, we've been working since 2016 on the energy transition, but the real focus on hydrogen has really come since 2019, and I think that echoes the, the, the Korean uh, story as well. Now, this is where I wanted to make the link to the clusters and the hubs. So Australia has announced uh, five um, hydrogen hubs. And the focus that I'm putting on those is that they are um, geographic locations where you've got things like infrastructure, ports for export, uh, access to energy networks, uh, a skilled workforce, um, contingent industries like mining, steel, aluminium, and ammonia. Um, what NIR has been working on is, is technology clusters and not surprisingly, there, those technology clusters have, have tended to group and emerge around where the key hubs are likely to be, the geographic hubs around Australia. And there are now 15 technology clusters around Australia, and they are literally all the way around the country. Um, and they're, they're featured on this map here. And they cover the entire value chain and the different potential end users. So depending on each region has got a slightly different uh, strategic advantage or competitive advantage that they see that they want to work on. So it, it, it could be agricultural, it could be mining, um, it could be more focused on export storage and then export. Each, each one of the regional technology clusters and the companies that are within that cluster have a slightly different focus. But what NIR is doing is working to bring all those clusters together into what we're calling a super cluster so that they can work on some common market issues, uh, the skills development, the regulatory issues together. So now we're saying is the time to build, to collaborate and grow. Um, we want to drive collaboration across the network and grow the cluster network and grow the international relationships um, of those technology clusters. We have just launched what we're calling the high capability portal. And these are the, those two things I really wanted to leave you with before we go to the panel session or to the next speaker, is that this is a portal that you can, you will be able to access from the NERA website and every technology company in Australia that's a partner in those regional clusters um, is able to go on and map their capabilities into this portal. So anybody can go on and see where we've got either technology capabilities, skills, or various other um, uh, capabilities across the country. So it's a really powerful way of visualizing um, what we've got in Australia. And it's a nice uh, partnership to what is called High Resource, which I think most people already know about. Um, it's a portal that NERA and Future Fuels CRC and CSRO um, partnered with. And it's a single source of information on all the organizations, policies and projects in Australia. And you can access that by the NERA website or by the CSIRO website. And it's got a summary of every single hydrogen production project and also research project and a, a summary of uh, the key research activities. Um, so as a final point, it's very clear that Australia is looking to collaborate internationally through the Low Admissions Technology Roadmap. Um, and our chief, uh, uh, Alan, Dr. Alan Finkel is leading that collaboration and we're seeking international research collaboration partnerships 
with um, countries on things like hydrogen, but also carbon capture and storage, uh, biofuels and, and, and various other um, things. So now in our language, now is the time for us to connect with you, to support, invest and to get involved. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Taylor. Uh, it, it, was, it, it was another great presentation on, on ongoing like cluster uh, of Australian hydrogen project. Okay. Our last presenter is, is President Jun Xin Yi. And thanks for waiting. Now the floor is yours. Okay, I was uh, I was in a very uh, hectic schedule. I don't know uh, some video problems there. Everybody share with my videos. Okay, we are seeing you and let's see your, how your video works. So is it uh, shared with everybody else? Mm, maybe not yet. So take your time and... Maybe a previous speaker should uh, release uh, sharing related uh, matters so that I could uh, have a uh, share screens so somebody at the korea foundation needs to give him yep. sharing capability there you go yeah okay good here he goes is it uh, is it shared already or yep now 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 we have a good screen okay so... very good and you can you can tell the yeah, the career foundation staff to turn to the next page if you want, or or if you can control it, then it, it is all fine. Maybe we could uh, do the presentation like this. Uh, uh, maybe. Or, uh, no, yep. Yeah, looks maybe, fine. Maybe today I'd like to discuss on uh, renewable energy. So a little, a little bit uh, out of uh, topics. Maybe everybody else focuses on uh, hydrogens, uh, hydrogen-related business, hydrogen-related technologies. But uh, my talk will focus on. Uh, better, uh, better on to the renewable energy overall the scope and cooperation ways. First, I'd like to talk about uh, some global issues. And the energy is uh, 50%, uh, around 50% would be the thermal energy related, and transport will be the 32, and electricity will be 17%. But that electricity again, uh, will be shared with summer 10% and transportation with around 3.3. Uh, so that adds, uh, sums up uh, around 40% uh, will be the electricity energy and other thermal and transport uh, energy is uh, composed in that way. And uh, conventional energies like uh, coal and other uh, previous speaker already talked about uh, coal cooperation uh, with Australia and Korea. And gas also LNG is some uh, input in there from Australia, Korea. We are depending on that uh, energy source. Oil, maybe Middle East, uh, nuclear, uh, maybe Middle uh, Asia. Renewable energies, uh, 
every conventional energy is decreased, uh, but only renewable energy it was able to uh, make uh, grow up, uh, grow up to uh, one point something uh, percent uh, last year. The total energy was greatly reduced over six uh, percent uh, overall in global related matter. CO2 is identically reduced. Three billion, around three billion tons was uh, reduced. We never absorbed in even in uh, World War II. Uh, World War II, we never absorbed. Uh, the financial crisis, even very small little bit. Uh, but uh, last year, COVID-19 uh, crisis caused uh, 3 billion tons reductions. And then a little bit of uh, renewable energy uh, usage. And uh, renewable energy, among the renewable energies, solar and wind power, uh, maybe half and half, 15-50 around uh, investigations, uh, but um, business, other businesses uh, uh, maybe decreasing bio, biofuels and others are not that uh, great amount. Uh, and we'd like to take a look at the major uh, electrical energy sources, coal, coal we are depending a lot on uh, import uh, from Australia, but that uh, is supposed to be reduced uh, greatly and uh, rapidly. And gas uh, may be maintained uh, somewhere around uh, current situation. And uh, nuclear also supposed to uh, not go down that easy. And oil industry, maybe oil industry will go down very calm, mobility, uh, maybe that energy so sectors, uh, great uh, variation will be the hydrogen and wind and solar uh, will expand and their sharing in uh, 2050 will be over 50 and close to 60% around. So it will be uh, growing very, very large. Hydrogen, uh, they are not expecting yet. Today, you discussed a lot about hydrogen but uh, still they are not counting it on as a major energy sources, uh, but they started to, in starting from 2025, 20, uh, there are a little bit of uh, hydrogen uh, will uh, enter into the energy related uh, statistics. So it will uh, grow on uh, the various kinds of uh, uh, applications, car applications, power and other, uh, uh, industry uh, applications uh, with hydrogen energy sources. So hydrogen demand will grow up definitely uh, by the 2050, will continue to grow on. Uh, that is the expectation. But as of now, that uh, statistically it has not appeared yet. The renewable energy source and other sources, we uh, sort of sell a uh, great amount of uh, cost reduction was there, not uh, other uh, new renewable energy sources. And over 100, over 100 nations already declared carbon neutrality. Uh, but I'd like to see also this is going to be the leg legality. Legally, they had to declare. It looks like Australia needs to declare or legality work is uh, still needed. Uh, other countries uh, going ahead. And other private sector, renewable uh, RE 100, renewable energy 100. And we have uh, Korea, uh, seven other uh, SK and other seven, seven other companies joined already. So renewable energy that uh, by 2030, they would like to have uh, their company energies uh, use 100 uh, energy percent as a renewable energies. So domestically, we do have, uh, we do have uh, some uh, renewable energy sources around 10% around and LNG and coal, coal steel 30, 40%, but we'd like to reduce very much. And nuclear, uh, we would like to uh, go for the decarbonization and de-nuclear uh, maybe schemes. So pretty soon, uh, a lot of variations and uh, we are driving new and renewable as a, a government project up to a uh, year of uh, 2030, we'd like to have 20% of uh, energy sources sharing that targeted uh, with a lot of uh, 50, 70%, 60% around will be the solar and wind around 30% and bio and other 
small little uh, sharing. And that uh, application area, agricultural large scale and small uh, project and uh, maybe some BIPB applications are there. And we are driving the national uh, wise very big project uh, Korea New Deal, um, new green green New Deal project, 1.5 trillion Korean won project, and we do have uh, uh, some temperature reduction, uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction approach, um, and also we'd like to share uh, the president of uh, uh, Korea uh, declared uh, uh, carbon neutrality by. Uh, 2050, and that's going to be the uh, maybe 100% uh, sharing, but uh, this is going to be the normal point. Korea increased very much to 150%, but we would like to reduce, cut off uh, those growing carbon uh, generations into the entire, to the zero, net zero zip uh, to that state we, we need to do. Uh, very hard work on this uh, carbon neutrality related and legality. Uh, they are uh, supporting a lot of uh, project uh, support that it's going to be the uh, sharing with new and renewable energy sharing, solar and then waste, wind and other bio source, hydrogen. Uh, so hydrogen, maybe uh, next year it will be counted uh, officially. Uh, energy department is not uh, sharing yet uh, as a major energy source, but uh, starting from next year, it will be. That uh, is going to be the general solution. Sunlight will be the uh, solar cells and photovoltaics. Uh, that's going to be over 50%. And then a little bit of uh, wind power uh, sharings and other geothermals and bio related matters. And uh, renewable energy cost uh, is still uh, we are suffering a lot, but uh, it is uh, continuously going down, uh, starting from 160 to the uh, 60 levels. Uh, so it's very cheaper and cheaper every day. So that is S, uh, SMP variation also getting reduced. Future cooperation ways, and then uh, we wanted to take a look at the uh, portions. In Australia, we do have a lot of LNG sources, oil, maybe Middle East, uh, Australia with Russia, uh, bituminous, uh, that will be the coals. And then uh, various kinds of coals will be there. Uh, and tra and site uh, will be one. That's very small amount, but still it is coming from the Australia and then nuclear power source also sources uh, coming from the Australia and Russia, Kazakhstan. And renewable energy, hydrogen, high, renewable hydro, renewable, that will be the water uh, power source related uh, matters. Uh, but uh, we'd like to move on uh, to the next, uh, maybe next page. Uh, screen, uh, touch screen is not working it on. So oh, let's uh, move on. Uh, other uh, sharings, uh, uh, some uh, industrial sharings and residential sharings, transportation, and some uh, public sectors. Electricity, half of the electricity is shared by the industrial sectors and public, and their sharing is there in uh, Korean uh, energy statistics. But uh, uh, we'd like to take a for the future cooperation. We'd like to take a look at the uh, Australia uh, situations. They do have uh, some decarbonizations in, uh, by the 2050, but they do have uh, uh, low carbon electricity, greenhouse, and then some fuels and C. Uh, and I'd like to put an emphasis on uh, CCS. Nobody today put an emphasis on CCS, but uh, we'd like to open up a, some communication channels for that uh, CCS because Australia may be going ahead of us. So we'd like to learn more about it and some uh, photovoltaic we'd like to discuss some that is going to be the situation uh, here um, year of 10 uh, 20 years around uh, 10 year of uh, 2010 and 2020 around so the lowest uh, power previously russia nuclear was very low so coal coal was now situation after uh, 10 years later on, the situation pendulum swung on and then it uh, moved on to the 
uh, solar PV, so hydro, uh, maybe sun power generation, even Australia, the lowest power generation source will be the Korea also, uh, maybe solar power. So solar power very much uh, maybe supplied in, in the world uh, as a uh, compatible power source, uh, as a low, SCOE, the lowest uh, power source. So I think uh, Australia does have very, very strong background in uh, uh, photovoltaics and the very world highest uh, efficiencies like UNSW, New South Wales uh, University, uh, Professor Martin Green uh, does have a uh, world uh, record also very high efficiency solar cells. And uh, we do have very, very strong background in uh, manufacturing for the photovoltaics and uh, module systems, we could have uh, cooperation in that uh, area. And then also, uh, we don't have any very large storage in uh, uh, carbon capture storage, CC, CCS, but uh, Australia looks like a very large uh, storage system here and there. Uh, so we could, uh, we would like to share uh, this technology and then um, launch some project if it is possible. So hydrogen today, we discuss a lot about hydrogen cooperation, even if we generate hydrogen in uh, Australia, uh, during the transportation, we get lost a lot, so maybe 30-40% will be get lost after the even after the liquefied. So they are suggesting a lot of uh, ammonia state uh, because we do have industrial background already already going on storage. And then uh, during the transportation, we may not lost that much. So it is even uh, maybe easier to handle uh, handling it on. So uh, we are today talking about a lot of uh, hydrogens, but uh, using these hydrogens, uh, maybe we could uh, maybe some ammonia will be the better cooperation ways they are uh, thinking about it and uh, use a lot of various kinds of maybe agri not only agriculture but also uh, some power generations also they could uh, use it but also we need to cooperate with some uh, dark curve uh, may maybe fluctuation power fluctuations and we would like to have some storage schemes uh, for this uh, uh, maybe batteries or some sort of storage, energy storage approaches. That energy storage, uh, power to gas, green, uh, maybe green hydrogen. Green, green hydrogen means we have uh, some uh, solar power plant in uh, Australia. Uh, maybe we could uh, build. And then that uh, power plant, green uh, uh, electricity could uh, change it into the hydrogen or ammonia. And then that will be the most desirable ways. Next will be the, some uh, hydro or uh, maybe pump, uh, maybe uh, some sort of uh, water power, wa water reservoir type of approach. The other will be the uh, heat storage, uh, like instead of, uh, uh, instead of uh, lithium ion battery storage, ECSS, uh, ESS storage related matters we are using in this approach, but there are others, uh, other, uh, approaches will be there. Some uh, reservoir, water reservoir approach, heat, uh, heat uh, storage approach, battery storage approach, various kinds of uh, uh, some storage related cooperation we could cooperate, but also we could have uh, power sector couplings and various kinds of uh, uh, maybe some, uh, some of the uh, different kinds of uh, uh, power sharings or power source sharings. That is going to be the summary that I'd like to talk about it, but energy is not changing that easily because coal takes 60 years to share energy percentage 50% that shared 60%. Uh, so oils take 40% sharing, gas shared only 25. Renewable energy, we are hydrogen we are now talking about, that would be very slow. And then uh, because it is not electronic uh, goods and electronic product, it takes long time. We need to talk about 50, 60 years of uh, uh, time schedule and that uh, sort of uh, timeline. And that's it uh, for the day in reference. Thank you for the listening. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, President Yi. Uh, 
your, your comprehensive picture of renewable energy was also very helpful. Okay, and thank you all for great presentations. And now we will start a discussion session. A green technology, renewable energies, and especially hydrogen uh, is being highlighted as a key uh, energy source in the future. And I was very happy to see several ways to enhance Korea-Australia cooperation in, in these emerging sectors. Okay, but uh, I, I would certainly uh, like to elaborate a, a little bit more. And also other renewable energies are very important too. So, and I often thought that the future energy mix uh, will be a lot more diverse than the past energy system based on, on coal, oil, and gas. So uh, we will face certainly a very kind of diverse future uh, of, of using uh, several, like multiple green technologies. Okay, uh, I, uh, I will do it this way. I have a, a couple of questions, but I, I will uh, give one set of questions to the Korean side and another set uh, to the Australian side. And we have a couple of questions uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the online audience. So what uh, they are, they are actually uh, popping up a, a few very interesting uh, question about Korean, Australian, uh, especially hydrogen exchange. Okay, so uh, let's go for the first set of question. Uh, First, I will ask the question to the to, uh, prominent speaker from the Korean side. Well, Korea has highlighted the hydrogen economy and carbon neutrality as two major goals. And especially regarding hydrogen, initiatives are very visible in the mobility and transportation sector, but, act, uh, but the application uh, is, is, and the scope are, 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 are definitely widening. However, energy transition is not always easy and smooth. So what do you think is a major strength and weakness of Korea in achieving the hydrogen economy and carbon neutrality? So that is my common question for the Korean speaker. And uh, to the Australian side, uh, let me uh, put it this way. Australia is a resource rich country and it, it ranges from coal, gas, mineral, and renewable energy sources, including hydrogen. And also Australia is a major energy exporter. Uh, even though earlier presentation mentioned about the, these issues, uh, I would like to elaborate uh, a discussion a little bit more deeper uh, into the issues. How, First, how the ongoing progress in green technology will reshape the Australian external energy policy, uh, especially the uh, export portfolio vis-a-vis -vis, uh, LNG and coal. So uh, today's speaker uh, mentioned a lot about the hydrogen and other renewable energies and the expansion of those resources to to Indo-Pacific and, and eventually to Korea. But, uh, but will that there be a fundamental change of energy uh, export portfolio or just it, it is kind of uh, adding another like a small sector to existing one? So that is my first set of question. And my second question is how the expansion of Indo-Pacific strategy based on the Quad Alliance, the US, Japan, Australia, and, and India uh, affect the Australian policy because nowadays that is also the, the, the big uh, challenge to, to Korea uh, to participate in, in, in a number of, of the issue-based or other institutional-based uh, collaboration. So uh, that will be my two sets of questions to the Korean and Australian side. So, uh, so sure, we start from uh, from the reverse order, if uh, that means, uh, Professor E, would you start first?
Yes, uh, today I discussed about uh, general situation uh, in the renewable energies and hydrogen. Hydrogen, yes, it will be grow up definitely. Everybody's uh, uh, talk about hydrogen economy, hydrogen industry, and a lot uh, of uh, conglomerate enter into the new business. Uh, so. Uh, I do not think it is going to be the going backward or uh, irre irrevocable uh, in, uh, investment is uh, going on. So that is a good symptom, but uh, how can we uh, you know, uh, disseminate and how can we uh, get things going on that uh, we need to today discuss uh, more about uh, hydrogen, uh, liquid, uh, liquefied hydrogens and how can we, uh, transport them, how can we generate them with green energies? In Korea, we do, we do not have any uh, very strong uh, industry background for the um, electrically, you know, uh, dissociate this water splitting. So, and hydrogen uh, technology is not that uh, strong. So we need to maybe uh, built up, uh, maybe that uh, portions could be discussed by Songbok uh, Kim project leader, Songbok Kim could uh, discuss about those kinds, uh, our industrial background and technology strategy. How can we reinforce our uh, domestic background on the hydrogen generations and talk about uh, how can we have very efficient uh, input strategy. Uh, I think uh, we do have, uh, even if uh, we import it uh, from the, uh, Australia, we are losing a lot during the, uh, during the transport uh, process. So that uh, uh, problem we need to discuss, how can we circumvent or how can we uh, maybe solve those ongoing problems or expected uh, problems? Uh, maybe uh, project leader, uh, Dr. Songbo Kim could, uh, talk about uh, those uh, raised uh, matters, maybe. Uh, but I, I'd like to give you back, uh, back on. Okay, thank you very much, President Yi. Uh, I, I will certainly uh, bring, uh, invite uh, Mr. Kim, Kim well, at, 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 well, a few minutes later, okay? Uh, so, uh, so next I will invite uh, Ms. Miranda Taylor for, the comment. Um, so to answer the questions that you posed to the Australian audience. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, right, I've got to try and remember what they were. Um, okay, I can, I, I can repeat if you want. No, no, Miranda, that's okay. You want to, uh, fine. Handle the um, export side of things, I can handle the, the quad uh, sure. side. If you want to divide it up that way, um, I'd be happy to. Sorry, um, I was just, I was gonna, so yeah, you go, you go, sure. Oh. Okay, then, then, uh, then why don't we have, have James Boyne first and, and, and then uh, uh, Randa Taylor will. Sure, well, I can, um, as you mentioned, uh, so I think the question was around what role um, the energy transition might have for the quad, is that correct? Is that, am I reading that right? Uh, well, I actually yeah. for, for the Australian side, but yeah, my two question was first, yeah. uh, how yeah. the future, uh, yeah. Export put energy. Okay. Export. Okay. Yeah. Those two yeah. okay. So, yeah. so that was the first question, and, and the second okay. question. Sure. Yep. Well, okay. well, so, well, um, yeah. I think if you, um, I think if you're looking at transformation, we might be looking more at like evolution rather than than revolution. Um, from hyd in terms of hydrogen coming on as uh, the next major export opportunity, and certainly you're seeing a lot of our natural gas companies take an interest in this because of the. The prospect for sort of blue hydrogen and and uh, easing out of those sort of carbon pathways, I guess, is, is a way to put it. Um, and I mean, there's also those options that are being looked at in uh, like revival of domestic manufacturing in Australia by using our hydrogen for for green steel and those sorts of things. I'm not sure that that's particularly been proven as economically viable yet, but it is, it is an exciting sort of proposition as well in terms of our export um, portfolio. I think um, what's interesting is um, from the geographic perspective, it won't be that much diversification because we're looking again at Japan and Korea as being the big partners. Uh, and we've already had those two obviously in the 
the LNG and the iron ore and coal sort of side of things. Um, one interesting thing from that perspective is that China will probably play a smaller role in Australia's hydrogen ambitions for um, the near future because um, the development pathway in China is a lot less proven, particularly around whether it's going to be an importing country or it might be self-sufficient on that side of things. Um, so that's interesting in the sense that Australia's had a few geopolitical problems with its trade portfolio with China on that side of things. So it could be a strategic opportunity as well. Um, I think on the second question around what role may be yeah, related to the Quad. Um, so the Quad obviously is expanding its scope from um, being sort of mainly security focused to looking at certain other areas and climate change is certainly one of those. I haven't really seen too much on the specific energy side of things. Um, but there's scope there for sure, particularly with that, I think, spine of Australia, Japan, uh, because hydrogen and, and renewables uh, are going to be featured quite big in that. Um, India, I am not certain about developing in a way, um, developing very quickly on the hydrogen side of things. Obviously, there's some renewable side uh, activity there, but as an importing country and the trade and investment linkages between Australia or other countries is not particularly proven there. Um, what's interesting uh, from the Quad perspective as well is that the US used to have, uh, in the Trump era, formed these strategic energy partnerships with four countries, well, three countries, and they were the three Quad countries. Um, and so those were actually looking at this specific um, nexus of climate and foreign policy, um, energy and, and foreign policy. It was more focused on natural gas because of the, the US shale boom. But I think maybe there's some potential there to kind of look at strategic relationships between these three countries and, and the US, so the four countries in total, and what role the energy might play in broader geopolitical strategy. But at the moment, I don't think it's developed. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miranda. Would, would you add? Yeah. So I'll come at it from a completely different angle. Um, oh, excellent. Yeah. So, um, look, I don't think there's any doubt that the hydrogen journey is both an exciting one and a challenging one. And I don't think that we've landed on the scale of what the, the trading part of the molecules of hydrogen is actually going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree uh, with the professor about, about, you know, the potential for ammonia. I, I, I think the fact is that we have to be working we have to be working on multiple levels with our key trading partners that we see that James has, or Mr. Burns covered so well. Even within, I think that the, in the hydrogen space in Australia, the projects here are working on the fact that they will need to have some, they need to work on the domestic demand as well as working on the potential export. And so we need to be working on sort of a, where, the, where the uses can be in Australia to support early stage projects while we're working on some of the issues that we still need to work with Korea and Japan um, to look at the, the cost curve of, of, of transportation, um, which is a big challenge. Um, not one we can't necessarily solve, but it is a, a, a big challenge. The other issue for Australia is that renewables don't come without a cost. So all of the solar and the wind and those things come with their own environmental footprint, which we also have to manage. And, and um, you know, the scale of solar that you would need to support mass hydrogen production is, is, is quite extensive. So we've got to work through things like land access, desalination, the, the environmental footprint, the recycling, um, so, that, and then we're looking at things like offshore wind because there's a social license uh, issue that goes with large solar and, and wind. But there's no doubt that Australia's got the highest penetration of rooftop solar of any country in the world. So that the, you know, that cost is coming down. We do see that LNG and gas is going to play a role um, in the energy transition. And, and I guess the, the, the point of truth will be when the cost of, of uh, LNG gas um, starts to look comparable to where we can get hydrogen to from, from renewables. And I think that that'll be the point of truth. So there's a, there's a number of points of truth yet to be worked through, which is why we have to be working up all solutions, including, and I completely agree, 
that we need to be working up things like carbon capture and storage. And I think one of the reasons why carbon capture and storage hasn't been successful in the past is because it's focused primarily on the coal industry. Um, and if we're going to get carbon capture to be an economic reality, and, and we need it, I mean, to get to net zero carbon, we've got to find every single way we can to capture the carbon or, or, or to remove it or to not have it. So we, we need carbon capture and storage because there are industries that are hard to abate and we're going to have to look at a whole of industry approach to carbon capture. And Australia does have some uh, some geological um, advantages that means that we could do carbon capture um, in some of our reservoirs in the northwest but also elsewhere but we need to get that to scale and we absolutely need the research collaboration partnership with countries like Korea um, because we don't have time to be working on the questions uh, each country on their own we've actually got to reach out and that's why uh, Dr Alan Finkel is leading the international collaboration on, on, on research projects for the five, the five areas that are identified in the low admissions technology roadmap. Um, so I, I think it's a big opportunity. It's a, it's a challenging one. Um, and Australia has lots of advantages, but I do agree that the energy world of the future is going to look somewhat different. Um, and we are gonna have a lot more distributed, diverse energy solutions at point of need. So you're going to have, um, you know, it, it, the, 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 the big capital industry that was the coal and oil and gas industry of the past may, may possibly not look like the same in the future. Um, that, that's the sort of challenge we've got. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Ms. Taylor. Oh, that, that was a very important point. Yes, we do have goal, we do have vision, but, but at the same time, reality check is important. And also, we do need to see multiple angles to achieve the carbon neutrality. Many different weapons and many different tools will be, will be needed to achieve energy, successful energy transition. And we have to be efficient and we have to uh, be very, very realistic at some point to address the issues. Okay, so uh, then uh, let me invite uh, Mr. Songbo Kim uh, also to address the Korean challenges. Oh, please unmute. Okay. Okay. Great. okay. Thank you for all about uh, discussed today. And I briefly say, uh, Korean has, uh, as I mentioned on the uh, presentation, Korean has the strong point uh, the utilization, such as mobility and uh, the, the drone, something like the the utilization is our strong point, but as well as uh, the fuel cell, you know, fuel cell as well. Uh, incidentally, tomorrow I will go to the huge uh, uh, fuel cell complex, uh, the opening ceremony. So, uh, but in the other hand, we we don't we lack of the uh, renewable energy uh, source. So of course, uh, the, we try to uh, offshore wind or uh, solar power uh, renewable energy developed, but still we lack of that kind of the uh, situation. So we focused on our uh, the government focused on the uh, overcome this kind of these other advantages. Uh, so for example, still we are going to develop from to, to hydrogen ecosystem. Uh, this is, uh, we are focused on the uh, hydrogen ecosystem and uh, we, we, we have uh, the specific uh, R&D project, like uh, the more, the, uh, Electrosis, uh, the system we progress or developed our uh, research and uh, uh, develop. So secondly, we focused on the we still need, we still lack of the manpower. So our government we as Korea as well uh, the focus on the manpower training and build up new 
hydrogen ecosystem and manpower training. So this is why we we uh, concentrate on the our the, uh, hydrogen economy promotion, and then I think. Uh, uh, as well, the other hand, we focused on the uh, still, still, you know, still the uh, hydrogen cost is high, so that is a very, uh, very difficult barrier to us. So we we focused on the green hydrogen. So we wanted to uh, cooperate with Australia, and we uh, need uh, more reasonable and uh, cheap. Uh, the hydrogen, green hydrogen, especially green hydrogen. So uh, I think this is not an easy task, but the Korean government and the private and the public sector is all together focused on the and making progress, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Kim. Uh, well, I'm well, well, somehow of a time. Well, I'm I have just a few more a minute left, but uh, uh, I would also uh, like to convey some some que question from the online. Well, there, there are many many audience on in, in, well a raising question on, on popping up in, in YouTube one and well uh, I yeah summarized a, a few questions in, into one. Uh, the biggest uh, curiosity uh, was to what extent uh, Korean, Korea, Australian energy transaction, including hydrogen exchange, uh, will grow in the future. What is your realistic prospect of market growth in the next decade? So that was uh, the most common uh, and invisible question from the floor. So. Well, I, I will just leave it open and anyone can, can jump in the question. Maybe, maybe from, from the Australian side or so. I'll start and then maybe Gordon can say something. Look, I think there's no doubt that um, Korea, you've got expertise in things like fuel cell technology um, that is, you know, your, 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 your technology um, is gonna be so vital to, to Australia um, if we're going to decarbonize as well. So given, given that we're trying to work on, you know, some common challenges, I think there's, 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 obviously, there's obviously some huge opportunities where we've got different strengths that we can bring to the table. And I think that that is really important, that we, we have different things. So there's things that are evolving to meet the Australian environment, like we've got the LAVO hydrogen battery coming out of University of New South Wales. Um, so there's some very interesting technologies, but your, your technology know-how and your manufacturing capability, our LNG expertise, the, you know, that we've been doing LNG export, all that, all the technology and the skills that went into the LNG industry can be deployed over into uh, things. We've also, we've also got sort of you know, mass deployment of renewable energy. So we've worked through some of the challenges to do with um, managing uh, the, the 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 integration of renewable energy into a into the energy system. So there's some just obvious cross points where we can work together. Okay, uh, maybe uh, James, you you have oh, oh. Professor, yeah. Right? Yeah. I chime in on the little bit. James will have something yeah. to add to this as well. But I mean, on on a very fundamental level demand signals are, are really important from korea just because of, of, of scale of industrial use um and again uh, again australia remains a relatively small population there's only 25 million of us uh there are obviously um you know demand signals internally within australia but that's from the east coast whereas when, when you look at most of the resources that we've been talking about uh, and if you're talking about this, the fundamental idea of bottling sunshine, you're really talking about Western Australia, and we just don't have the internal demand. We're small. We have a population of 2.6 million people. And so in order for that to fundamentally develop, particularly in Western Australia, uh, it's going to require external demand signals. Uh, and here I'll say something maybe a little bit controversial, uh, but really the key is going to be Korea, Japan, cooperation together with 
technologies coming out of Europe, et cetera. Uh, earlier, one of the questions that you asked Miranda and James, yep. how does this overlap with the quad, right? Exactly. One of the things that all these countries in the world are looking at is supply chains. So they're looking at security of supply chains. They're looking at how do we make sure that we don't have an over-dependence on a single country? And that's from everything from critical materials and rare earths on the one side to energy supplies on the others. We're looking to have a diversification of that. And so in the end, Korea alone isn't sufficient to, to sustain and build an industry and a transportation network, a conveyance network, that would be required to get the Australian industry up and running, like Miranda was talking about. What you really need is Korea together with Japan, together with growing markets in India, with technology from the US and from Europe, et cetera, working together. And so this, again, I, one of the takeaways I got from four excellent presentations is the level of complexity requires international cooperation. It's not something a single firm can do and it's not something a single country can do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why I, I think this dialogue is so encouraging because it, it's the start of something, but others need to be involved as well. Well, that, that was a very important point. You know, having a multilateral setting uh, in enhancing the, the further collaboration, well, that will certainly uh, boost up our, and, and, and boost up the, the collaboration and also give a very stable platform uh, for a sustainable the cooperation. I would just add to that, Gordon mentioned Western Australia as being the center of the current LNG industry in Australia. And um, there was a recent comment from the Premier of Western Australia saying that basically they want the, the our state, Western Australia, to have the same market share in hydrogen that we do in LNG, I think within probably the decade. Um, and also, I mean, that's quite ambitious, but that's sort of the sort of level of um, ambition that's talked about in Western Australia as well. And Western Australia doesn't have the comparative advantages uh, on hydrogen compared to other states and territories that it does on LNG. So, so you might be looking at other states and territories of getting in a competitive process on that side of things. Um, also, I mean, in terms of resource advantages, I should say, we do have obviously the infrastructure and that side of things. Um, I'd also return to those three priorities. I mentioned the National Hydrogen Strategy, which was to be a top three exporter to Asia, to be a desti destination of choice for international investors, and to have major offtake or supply chain agreements in place with importing countries. And if you have conversations with industry here, a lot of them say like, yeah, we need that basically big uh, investment from an external partner to come in. So that's, you know, if it's going to be Korea, then obviously <laughs> that would be fantastic um, from the Australian perspective. Um, but certainly the, the intent is there. There's massive challenges, obviously, to replicate what we've done in LNG or other areas. Okay. All right. So uh, now, I, now I think uh, this is a time to wrap up the session. Well, time was definitely too short to, to fully address this challenging issue. But uh, at some point, we, we, we have to. Uh, to close the session and but actually we have learned a lot from the presentation and discussion from the prominent expert. Uh, unfortunately, uh, President Kun Lee of Korea Foundation could, could not join uh, in, in the first part of the session. And Dr. Kun Lee uh, asked me to convey uh, his sincere apologies for, for being unable to participate uh, in this webinar due to technical problems. On behalf of Dr. Lee, I, as the moderator, would like to deliver his deep appreciation for all the renowned speakers joining us today and uh, give special thanks to Professor Flake for his keen engagement in, the, in this event. In, uh, in his prepared speech, uh, President Kun Lee also meant to point out the significance of this webinar being held at the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Korea and Australia, and expressing his hope that these constant ripples of cooperation will have built a current that gives a way uh, to a more resilient and sustainable world. So we uh, discussed the issue of green recovery, and green recovery is a big task. The unexpected pandemic brought a deep economic impact, and a lot of people have lost their familiar lifestyle. We are trying to recover, 
and restore normal life. And this is what we call resilience. However, resilience does not just mean going back to the past. A successful recovery based on, on dynamic resilience will lead to a new stage. The pandemic has loosened the inertia from the past and accelerates a paradigm shift in industry, transportation, education, and our everyday life. In that sense, green recovery is a door for the new future and green technologies will enable us to navigate in the new future energy system. I once again appreciate the Korea Foundation, President Kun Lee, for having arranged this wonderful event. I'm also greatly thankful for a wonderful presentation and insight of the panelists from Korea and Australia. I also express my gratitude to the audience and their warm attention. Thank you all. And now I'm closing the session. Goodbye.